Wake up in the morning, blaze you a blunt. How you feel like me? But I do this like seven days a week, and I probably won't get no sleep. Why Mr. Jam, thanks what? for speaking to us. Thanks for speaking at to last, me. At, at last, last, exactly. It's only taken about <laughs> weeks, months. So yeah. thank you very much for the Beatnik guys for hitting us up and getting this uh, organised. Yes. So we've got lots to talk about. One of them being an album that's free, which yep. we'll come on to in a minute. Yep. So people can download that for nothing, and we'll give them information shortly. Yes. But just to go back a little bit, for anyone who doesn't know who Mr. Jam is and what you do, there's two radio stations that are sister stations, as I say, Radio One and One Extra. Yep. And you've got a show on both. Yeah. <laughs> How? Why? Why have you got both? <laughs> well, it's, 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 um, it's a weird story because I was basically, I was, I've been DJing for years and years and years, predominantly multi-genre, but you know, I've always been into kind of hip hop and drum and bass and garage and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And I was putting on events back home in Nottingham and putting on hip hop events, UK hip hop events. Yeah. And I, I started this thing with a few friends of mine called UK Takeover. And the idea of it was is that we get grime MCs, UK hip hop MCs, and kind of the full spectrum of, of MC and culture in the UK yeah. and put it together on one bill. And we got to like UK Takeover 3, and a friend of ours was on one extra. Right. So we said, look, who do we talk to to get them to come up and you know, yeah. maybe cover it for, for one extra? We managed to get one extra to come to the third UK takeover and they brought Ace and Biz and Ace and Biz hosted it. And it yeah. was cool, but I was kind of more backstage at that point and just counting all the money that we'd lost from putting on these events. <laughs> but then it got to UK takeover four and because three had gone so well for one extra, they said, let's come up again. Yeah. But this time it was like, look, I'm going to host it and I'm going to DJ. And so I did. And they spotted me and basically said, do you want to try out for a show? Um, that was on the Friday. On the Tuesday, I went in <laughs> to try out for the show, was offered the show and started the month afterwards. And that was back in what, 2005 or? 2005, yeah. Wow. Been there ever since. So you, yeah. <laughs> Veteran in the game, eh? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, in comparison to the, the One Extra show and the Radio One show, is there any difference in control? Because a lot of people who have a, a radio show on the bigger station, so to speak, yeah. often get claimed, oh, you know, they, they get dictated what to play. Well, I know you don't. Yeah. You know, but is there a difference between your One Extra show and the, radio, and the one, uh, radio One show? The, the remits are different. Right. So across the course of the week on One Extra, it's about new music um, from the kind of the spectrum of what One Extra represents, whether yep. that be drum and bass, whether that be hip hop, dancehall, R&B, dubstep. And then the Saturday night show is focused more in on dubstep and, and bass music. Yep. So I have full control over what it is that I play. Um, I have a fair amount of control over the DJs that, that provide our daily dose of dubstep mixes for us. Yep. But I'm, I've just got the two different remits, so it's two slightly different things to think about. For me, it's all about making sure that there's a broad spectrum represented. Because when I got into dubstep, the record that got me into dubstep, I was kind of like a third wave dubstepper. It was um, Banger and Koki's Night. Yep. And Banger and Koki's Night is not a tear out tune. Nope. You know, it's, it's, it is what you would traditional, traditionally call dubstep but it completely crossed over and then that for me was kind of like, yeah, that's great. And that brought me into the scene. I did my research and I was like, wow, this garage stuff that I used to be in a youth sound system playing yeah. is the roots of dubstep. And also this tear out stuff, really quite interesting as well. So like the, the early Rusco stuff and Cockney Thug and all that kind of stuff, I really was into and I was into that as much as I was into going and listening to like the DMZ stuff that I'd missed. Yeah. So for me, it's about making sure that your average person that's just getting into dubstep, and let's be honest, if you do listen to one extra, you might not know about Get Darker, you might not know who Hatcher is, you might not know about DMZ, you might not know about Forward, yep. but if you hear or see the word dubstep, it's really important to me that if we're representing it on a national scale on BBC Radio, we're representing the full spectrum of it. Yep. No, and that's a valid point. And I think I think you do your job pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note then, BBC, not trying to make you uncomfortable in answering this question. Why BBC? They're the people that gave me the opportunity. And they're the people that back me day yep. in, day out. You know, I, I have a lot of ideas. And let's be honest, there's a lot of radio stations without naming names, but it will become very obvious who it is when I say it, who completely have cut back on their specialist music output to the mm. point where it's an hour and that isn't really representing the underground no. music scene. No, you know, the BBC come in for a lot of flack. 
but they use public money to make sure that there is an underground scene that is represented. Yeah. You know, when you look at One Extra, when you look at Radio One, Giles Peterson, the stuff that he plays, you can't hear that on any other radio station other than Radio One at that time. The yeah. stuff that Benji B plays, you know, the stuff that I play, the stuff that that even when you go to One Extra, Cameo and DJ Q and Robbo Ranks, you know, there's no other radio station that dedicates an entire night to dancing. Yeah. There's no other radio station that gives an hour each night to dubstep. Yeah. You know, so for me, I love working at the BBC. It does come with its challenges. I'm sure. Lots of red tape, it's a massive corporation, but they still give me quite a lot of freedom, and the freedom for me to be able to champion the music that I genuinely love, yeah. and, and give it a platform, you know, with the Saturday night show, the dubstep being as it is, the bass music being where it is right now. It's fantastic for me to be able to say, two hours on a Saturday night, we can represent that. Yeah. See, I'm really passionate about making sure that what I'm doing on BBC Radio, not only has a legacy, but also is representing the right stuff, yeah. And it's not just doing it, you know, because of when I came into dubstep, there's a lot of people that could say that I was jumping on a bandwagon, but I wasn't. I think that when you look at the history of the fact that when I first went five days a week mm -hmm. on one extra, and it was about playing multi-genre, the second record I played was the Bengal and Koki record, you know. That for me, it's about making sure that, that I am listening to stuff, I'm giving people advice, and for those 12, 13 year old producers in their bedrooms mm. that do send me stuff on SoundCloud and say, you know, I've just got a crack copy of Reason, I've just got a crack copy of, of Massive, what do you think? And I go, sounds like you've listened to Skrillex just a little bit too much. <laughs> you know, I hope that they'll go back and when they're 18, they yeah. might be making much better music. Yeah. And have you got an opinion on the difference between the UK sound and the American sound? I do. I, I think the opinion that I have is that there's a lot of people that think that you can put the American sound in a box, mm. but then you kind of go to the Argon crew and you see what Matty G is doing and what 12 Planet's doing, and yeah. that is completely against the grain of what we think the American sound is. I think ultimately we're using our influences in the UK, and we've got a lot of sound system influence in the UK, so yeah. there's a lot of reggae influence in what we do. Um, a lot of European influence in what we do. When you go to America, there's going to be a lot of rock influence because yeah. that's what they grew up listening to predominantly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's horses for courses. I think that for every Skrillex, there is a Jay Kenzo. So there's a project you've just been working on. Yeah. And it's called Throw Your Dubs Up. It's got Mr. Jam on there. It's got uh, Snoop Dogg on there. Tell us about this, this project, how it come around. <laughs> it's one of them weird things where I know I'm doing the right thing because of things that happen. Um, so I, I get a phone call from my manager basically saying he's been approached by Snoop Dogg's management. Wow. Story goes, and I've heard this from Snoop since from his mouth. Story goes, when they came over to the UK to do the festival dates at the start of the summer, they were listening to Westwood's show on yep. Saturday night. As they were driving, my show comes on after Westwood and they heard what I was doing on the show and Snoop, it blew his mind. For him, he says that he's been into dubstep for a while. He obviously did that track with Chase and Status. Yeah. And he's fully aware of the dubstep scene because he's one of those guys that, even though he's a hip hop legend, he wants to know what's going on and he's, he's really musically cleaned up. So he approached my manager and said, look, we've got an idea. Would Jam like to support Snoop when he comes over to the UK to do his arena tour? Yeah. It's like, yeah, great, but we've also got another idea, can we get on the conference call? So there's me travelling to a gig in Windsor <laughs> with Snoop Dogg, Snoop Dogg's manager, my manager, and all of Snoop's A&R team basically on the conference call saying, look, we really love what it is that you're doing, we love the radio show, we have been listening for about three months, we love what you're doing. Um, we've had an idea and a concept in our head. In, a, in the West Coast, when you put up a W for the West Coast, look one of those, yeah. that's a dub. Dubstep, we've had the idea, let's call it throw your dubs up, do a mixtape, but we want to use the right stuff. We don't want to just kind of go for the, the bait stuff that's all on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So can you go and speak to some producers? You know, you tell us what's hot, send it over to us, and we'll get all of the doggy style records crew, Snoop Dogg himself, <laughs> and, and everyone basically to, to pick what they like and spit on it. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Not a joke. Did you have sweaty palms when you're talking? You know, like Pretty much, yeah. It's one of those where 
the conversation was me listening for like 45 minutes going, is this really happening? <laughs> for them, it was very, very, very important for them to make sure that they were doing it properly. Yeah. Because they, it's very, it'd be very easy for a, a big American superstar like Snoop to just pick up the phone and go, hey, I just want to do whatever's popular. Yeah. But for him, it was about making sure that it was being represented properly. And, and you know, I've since met up with Snoop in person. And he was saying how much he really enjoys the mixtape. Wow. He wants to actually get in the studio with UK dubstep producers yeah. so that they can see how he works, he can see how they work and create some original material. So hopefully that'll be the next stage of it. I mean, the, the impact that's potentially going to have is massive. So when I listened to the mixtape, I was expecting, and if I'm totally honest with you, that it's got West Side on it, you know, the, yeah. the that, is it that, is it? Yeah. It's either that or that, I've been told. Oh, I'm okay, I can't do it. Uh, there you go. <laughs> or that, that works, that works. Um, or that. And I, I just thought, because it's, gonna, it's got Snoop Dogg on it, it's West Side, it's very kind of american -y. I thought it was going to be very, very much what I heard at Ultra Festival in Miami in March. Yeah. Very heavy dance floor, which is no problem, but not very UK. Yeah. Um, now I can see now why, one, why you got involved, and two, the influence you've had on the whole thing, because it isn't that. No. There's Flux Pavilion on there, there's Gemini on there, and undoubtedly two of the most exciting UK producers at the moment. There is the Chasing Status track on there, which was massive. Yeah. You know, and, and a bunch of other tracks on there. I mean, how difficult was it for you to sort of take control and say, right, these are the tunes you're going to have, because you don't know yeah. what you're talking about, I do. I mean, uh, it was really, really interesting. I think the only thing that I'm just a little bit Mm, about is I sent them over about 65 beats and the way that the way that we did it is we used Dropbox so yeah. I'd contact the producers and I contacted pretty much my phone book you know from okay. Pinch to Gemini to Wire um, to Oris J to pretty much everyone that I could get a hold of saying yeah. look doing a mixtape with Snoop Dogg and his crew <laughs> have you got any beats you could send me so that I can send them over and, and they a lot of people Pretty much everyone that I approached said, yeah, no yeah. problem, we've got some stuff, or how about this that we've just released, or you know, all that kind of stuff. So I just put about 65 beats in, in the Dropbox folder to let them go through it, because I thought, I know what I'm putting in there is quality, and yeah. I'd be happy if they used any of it. And the fact that they've gone in and used you know, the, the True Tiger beat for, for yeah. Be Like Me, the fact that they've gone in and they've used a dream beat that Dream made specifically for that. Wow. Because he was like, what, a Snoop Dogg mixtape? All right, I've got an idea. <laughs> I'll send you something tomorrow. And he sent me and it was brilliant and it's on there. Yeah. You know, so I want this to be a project where if you are a kid in Estonia yeah. and you've just seen the word dubstep somewhere online, but you see, you know who Snoop Dogg is. Yeah. I want you to download that for free and go, ah, I get it. And then go to get darker and find out a bit more. Listen to Rips, yep. find out a bit more. Yep. Check out my shows and find out a little bit more. Hopefully those people that have grown up listening to Snoop Dogg will pick this mixtape up and go, hmm, I like this dubstep stuff. <laughs> so, where can they download it? Speakerboxworld.com. So going, going back to the, when you mentioned the supporting Snoop Dogg yeah. in UK arenas, and tell us a bit about that. I mean, supporting Snoop Dogg in UK arenas. Yeah. That's not something you wake up and do on the average Friday night. I remember going to primary school and getting snowed in, um, but standing at the bus stop and listening to Doggy Style yeah. like three times on the loop. And then I've just supported Snoop on the UK Arena Tour. And the reason why I've done that is because he heard my radio show <laughs> because he was coming back from a festival. I can't believe that <laughs> that, but that's how stuff works, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's how it, it happens. Is. It was, it was an amazing experience though. It was really, 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 you know, one of the definite career highlights for me. We did um, Liverpool Echo Arena, we did London O2 Arena, we did wow. um, Cardiff uh, Motorpoint Arena, and then we went up to Glasgow and finished it off at the O2 Academy in Glasgow. And the one thing that I was told by Snoop and his people was, please make sure you play dubstep. So, <laughs> Being able to do, I, I mean, I have to, no disrespect to anywhere else, but I have to say, standing on stage at London's O2 Arena for a sellout crowd, playing a track that was Snoop Dogg, P Money, DEE and Professor Green, that three weeks earlier, 
I'd mix the vocals down sitting at my kitchen table at four o'clock in the morning kind of blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and going back to uh, the summer. Yeah. Uh, you've obviously had a, a, a crazy summer with festivals and all sorts. I think this past festival season has been the first festival season where I've been able to go out there and kind of do what I do, which is just play big tunes. Exactly. And I think when, when you are playing out in the clubs as well, your radio show is very, very reliable. I think everyone knows that now. But more importantly, it's also even more exciting when you're playing live. Yeah. Because, yes, you're dubstep committed, but you also, you've got massive history in other genres. Yeah. And you're not afraid to throw them in. And there's not many other people that can mix dubstep and will throw in something completely, something <laughs> that shouldn't even fit. <laughs> but, so what are you playing on when you play in the clubs? And how are you getting this to work? Are you, are you on CDs? Are you on records? Are you on Serato? I'm, 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 I'm a Serato DJ. Yeah, I start, but this is, this is the thing. It's because I started out with belt drive turntables that if you tried to mix, it was really hard. You had to hold the record and keep it in time to mix. So back in those days, I was, you know, I was a teenager mixing garage and mixing yeah. hip hop and mixing dancehall. So the fact that I've got that background kind of means that when I am in the club now and I'm using Serato's and I use Serato and CDJ's and I don't, not really going in with Ableton. I haven't tried Tractor yet, but mm. you know, I'm really comfortable with Serato because I'm very hands-on. I like to mix, I like to scratch, I like to pull back and do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's just about making sure that the crowd are having a good time. And for me, I think the thing that I like doing the most is playing a record that the crowd are really familiar with and then hitting them with something that they won't know. Yeah. And trying to keep the level and trying to keep the vibe and trying to, trying to keep everyone on the dance floor with stuff that they know and stuff that they're not expecting. And, and seeing how stuff mixes. You know, I, I, the thing about Serato that I love is that it will show you tempos. Mm -hmm. So when you look at a tempo, you kind of go, oh wow, yeah, Big Pimpin' is actually the same tempo as Midnight Quest Line. <laughs> hmm. Ideas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> how does, hmm. <laughs> Um, one thing I know we have got together is UKF based culture. Oh yes. Alexandra Palace, which I have to say, is sold out. Yes. Two months in advance. <laughs> yes. What's that all about? <laughs> Obviously that's because of the Get Darker Room, not it's the Mr. Jackson. Surely show. because of the Get Darker Room. <laughs> I mean this is the thing, people are gonna be really upset because they're not all gonna be able to fit in the Get Darker Room. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be rammed. Well, uh, yeah, I think that is going to be one of the most exciting events of this year. Um, you're obviously playing uh, the lineups. Well, it is it? ridiculous. Yeah. So we're excited about that. Kickstart in 2012. You mentioned this new project that you won't tell us much about. Not yet. Are you sure? Not yet. When it's ready, All then right. you'll know about it. All right. But is there anything else for 2012 apart from that project? That, that there's, you... there's a few things. There's a few things that we're planning. Uh, I mean, you know, there's 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 a lot of things. There's, I mean, I'm already getting offers in for, for kind of big things next year. Yeah. Um, I'd love to be able to just kind of build on. My, my 2011's been one of the most successful years of my career so Without far. Without doubt. And I'd love to be able to build on what I've managed to do this year. And for me, it's all about the music. It's all about representing what it is that I like. And the thing that I will always say hand on heart, no matter what happens, if I don't like something, I'm not going to do it. Mm. And regardless of how much money is being paid, or regardless of who's doing it, or what's being said, or how beneficial it could be, if I'm not into it, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So there are going to be a good few things that I can't say. 2012 is going to be hopefully a good year, and hopefully I'll be able to take a few people along with me. The mixtape is tape. out now. Yes. You can download that right now as well. Um, so I have to say, and I really, really mean this, thank you very much no, thank for you. taking the time to speak to us. Any, Long genuinely, overdue. Genuinely, any time, any time, and we need to try and work something out for the not too distant future for you on my show. Let's do it. If I'm not busy. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>